Good evening. We finish Roman chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. Today we try to see if we can finish uh, the rest of the chapter until whatever time we can. We started late. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father Master, we come to your throne of grace, Lord. To see what you have for us. Again, to learn to check, to correct, to have that great joy of salvation that comes through your son. Keep our minds, Lord, subject to your spirit, to your truth. That our necks will yoke ourselves to what you've been teaching us. Keep us bound, Lord, to your truth. In your son's name, we offer this prayer. Amen. If I ask the question, what is the gospel? Or even more particularly, what does the gospel consist of? I know this question to many of us who have been in the Christian walk for quite some time would look, would appear to be too plural, too kiddish. Uh, you might say, Simon, we are a group of mature believers sitting for a study in the book of Revelation. And you expect us all to know what the gospel is. Have we not been taught so many years that even the word evangeline means good news? And the good news is obviously that the Son of Man has come. He has died for the sins of his people. If you are a Calvinist, you will definitely say that. And if anyone believes in him, he will be saved. Now the problem is, though this very much constitutes what good news is, for a common man or for the natural man, a good news can never be understood against what is the bad news. The good news can never be appreciated if the bad news is not told to man who is a sinner. And he has told to him again and again that he has broken the law of God. The bad news always became a cornerstone of preaching, even when Cornelius was preached, that Jesus is going to be the judge who's going to come. Or Paul telling to his listeners on Marcel in Acts 17, that Jesus will judge and people everywhere have to repent. You know, the point is still incomplete in some sense, isn't it? What about the reprobate? What about the people who God has predestined to hell. Does the gospel really mean anything to them? Now here's again a problem. Since we do not know who the reprobate are, how do we preach the gospel to anyone, particularly to them? Now Paul in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 onwards, says something like this. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor of his knowledge to us in every place. For we unto God, a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death and to the other, the savor of life unto life. Meaning we or the gospel that we preach to one people, one group of people, it's a sweet savor of Christ to them that are saved. But to them that perish, it's a savor of death. When we look at Revelation chapter 14, we saw from verse 1 to 6, the lamp and the 1,44,000 people, the church in which not a single person is lost. Each person, the last person is saved. We saw their future. And now, and now, in Revelation 14, we are seeing the future 
of the people whom we pass in Revelation chapter 13, the people who follow the beast. What is their future like? Is the question that we're going to see in Revelation 14. So the remaining section would be divided into two sections. In the first part, we see three angels. And in the third part, we see three angels. And in the middle, we see the Lord. And let's see the first part to begin with. Revelation 14, I'll read from verse 6 onwards. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue unto people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine or the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. We see here another angel different from the last one, flying in the mid heavens. In easier words, you can say flying in the middle of the sky. Why? So that everyone can see it. And as the angel flies, she's preaching. And she's preaching the everlasting gospel. Now, just as a very important side note, I, do, I will not dwell on this for long. This gospel, according to dispensational theology, is not the ordinary gospel. Now, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time, but according to dispensational theology, the classical ones, there are different gospels. There is a Pauline gospel, there is a Petrine gospel, there is a gospel of John the Baptist, and there's a gospel that the Lord himself preached. And the gospel that you see here is a different gospel, which is not the gospel which is found in the other books. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time saying how stupid or how false or and how wrong this is, but it will enough for your mind to think that this has to be the same gospel. Why? Because Paul, if you remember, tells you this, that it be us, when he calls himself, and any other angel will give you any other gospel. Let him be eternally anathema. Let him be eternally accursed. So let the thought not come into your mind that this is a different gospel. This is the same gospel that Paul preached, that John preached, that the Lord preached. That all the prophets, right from the beginning of time, preached to the sinful world. This is the same gospel. But look at the content. Okay, before that, to whom is the gospel being preached? This everlasting gospel. It says to those who dwell on the earth. Those who have been with us in the study of Revelation would know that this term refers to those unbelievers who are opposed to the Lord opposed to everything that the Lord does, opposed to the people of God. 
So here is an everlasting gospel proclaimed particularly to the people on the earth who are against the Lord. Now let's look at the content of this gospel. I want you to look at this very carefully. First, it preaches to everyone who dwells on the earth, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and to people. And then verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. On the outset, let this be noted that there is no invitation here. People, unfortunately, have landed calling up the gospel as an invitation. Gospel is not an invitation. Gospel is a command given by God for believers, for people to believe and to repent and to believe in his son. What does the word here say? Fear God and give him glory. It's exactly the same as they say, repent and believe in Jesus. Why is it said, fear God and give him glory here? Because till now we need to ask, fear God over against whom? The people who are dwelling on the earth, whom are you fearing? The dragon, the dragon's beast, the dragon's helpers. You're fearing those things, those creatures. But you have to fear God. Or in that historical context, you're fearing Caesar. But the angel is telling you, fear God. Give him glory. The angel is much more direct because his audience is in front of him. Here are people who are steeped in idol worship and to them he's saying, fear God. And if you notice, there is no mercy mentioned. Probably because angels really do not understand mercy, do they? The elect angels, the sinful angels, did not get the mercy of Lord. And they would be wondering, as we led, read last time from 1 Peter, that how do men, why do men get mercy? But if you go ahead, if you look at the message, it's a very urgent message. There is no time given. There is no time later. There is no second chance. It's an urgent message. Do you see the urgency? Look at that verse. It's saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour is come. The judgment of the Lord has come. And now, choose between the one who has created heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Your Caesars did not create it. The devil did not create it. When people are on the earth in the last time and they'll be worshipping things like the government, here's the news to them that it's time to worship God because your God that you worship, the idols that you worship, did not make the heavens, did not make the earth, did not make the waters. And what's more important, judgment has come. Now, if you've been following what we've been teaching, and this we have been said many times before, that for a Christian, there is always this understanding of what has been started and what is not yet. For example, there are many promises in the Bible which it says it's already there. We already got it. At the same time we read, it's not completely there yet. It's yet to come. For example, right from the idea of salvation in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we know today we are already saved. We are free from our sins. We are completely justified. 
but we also look at a time when we see a final salvation in the presence of the Lord, when we will not sin anymore, there is no much no sin left in our bodies and will be confirmed completely to the image of Christ. Similarly, do you remember the idea of glorification? Is the Christian glorified now? You remember Romans 8.30? It says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, he also justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. You have a similar thought in Ephesians 1. You're already seated in the heavenly realms in Christ. The already, but not yet. It is sure to happen when we see the Lord. Similarly, we learned about the kingdom of God. From the time Christ came, the kingdom of Christ has come. His kingdom has been inaugurated. You remember from the birth of Christ, the wise men understood this. Herod understood this. Sadly, dispensationalists don't understand that. But his kingdom has come. Same thought, but not yet. But so is the case for the judgment of God. If you remember from the time we started the book of Revelation, the seven seals followed by the seven trumpets, all expressing the judgment of God. It has already started in the people who dwell on the earth. As we are speaking even now, the judgment of God is still being poured on the world with all these problems, all the sicknesses, all the earthquakes. The judgment has already begun. In fact, every time you preach the gospel to someone and someone accepts the gospel, the Bible says he has everlasting life. Turn with me to John 3 verse 36. John 3 verse 36. I'll read that for you. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, meaning you already have everlasting life. Whosoever believes in the Lord has everlasting life today. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It doesn't say the wrath of God will abide on him, but the wrath of God is on him already. So the day of judgment has already begun. So it's time to tell the people that leave your cheap gods, leave the fake imitations, leave the Caesars and the Herods who think they are God but who have not created anything. So the first angel has done the announcement. Now let's look at the second angel. And there followed another angel, verse 8, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon has fallen. Those who are new to the book of Revelation would be probably scratching their heads. The person who is supposed to have fallen, we do not even know when this person was introduced. We already know the future of Babylon, but we do not know who this Babylon is. But for the book of Revelation, this is not new. A, fo a, a foreshadowing of what is going to come is always done in the book of Revelation. For example, if you remember chapter 11, you remember we, me we measured the holy city, the temple, the holy city, and that city was supposed to be given to the Gentiles for 42 months. But we see the holy city, the actuality of the holy city, as a beautiful bride coming from heaven 
ready for the wedding only in Revelation 21. Or the beast that comes from the abyss and conquers the witness church. We saw that in Revelation 11, 7. But we saw the beast coming out of the sea only in Revelation 13. So here, when we hear of a Babylon's fall, we need not be surprised. It's almost like we are shown something that's going to happen to this. Now, what is Babylon? If you turn to Daniel 4.30, you'll see the king Nebuchadnezzar declares about his Babylon. Full of pride, he calls Babylon the great. For a Christian in the first century who understood his Bible, the verse is Daniel 4.30, who understood the Bible would know this, that from the time all of Israel went into exile into Babylon, from the time Daniel refused to take up or eat what was given, from Babylon, from the way Daniel and his, bro and his brethren kept themselves from the wrongs and the errors of Babylon, Babylon always referred to a pagan power, all of pagan culture, all of pagan ideas that would oppress the people of God. As John is writing at this time, obviously he has in his mind Rome and the entire world system that Rome is showing itself out to be. In fact, this tradition that has been taken is taken from Isaiah 21, verse 9. Isaiah 21, verse 9. And it says something like this. And behold, here comes a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods, he has broken to the ground. Isaiah here is looking at the fall of the city somewhere close to the river Euphrates. This city, which has destroyed the nation of Israel, caught the people captive, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, taken the whole church with it. So Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is prophesying about the future of God's people and when he sees the future of God's people, he tells us what's going to happen to their people who took them captive. And he tells them that Babylon that captured God's people will fall. In fact, he says exactly the way we read, Babylon is fallen as if something has already happened just to show that this is going to happen. Nothing is going to stop it. It's already fallen. And when that Babylon fell, by the next empire that came in, you can go back to Daniel 7 to understand that, when the Middle and Persians completely destroyed Babylon and the people of Israel became free, John is now using that same imagery of that same Babylon, the great of Nebuchadnezzar, which had become the center of oppression for God's people, the center of every cultural error that Israel was buying itself to. Even in the future, as the imagery of that time Rome. In fact, the metaphor of drunkenness is taken from Jeremiah. You can turn to Jeremiah 51. Verse 7 to 8, it says something like this. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. Notice that. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. 
intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of our wine, therefore the nations are going mad. Suddenly, Babylon has fallen and been broken. It is in the hand of God. And it's intoxicating the earth. And see how the angel says the same theme from Isaiah. It is fallen. He's not saying it is falling as, we, as I'm speaking to you. Or Babylon will fall in some time future. No, we are at the last point in the book of Revelation of the last wars that's going to fill the earth. The last judgments. This Babylon has fallen. This is not that small city in modern Iraq. But it's a symbol of the complete human society that organizes itself in every fashion, political, religious, culture, economical, to come against the people of God and God's commandments. It's the defiance of God. As much as you see right from the Tower of Babel, a group of people who come together, thinking together, they could build a tower that could reach up to God. Together, they would be so self-sufficient that God would be at their mercy. Together, they'll build something that the entire world will see and marvel and they will not require God anymore. All the nations will come because they require each other. So if someone tells you that this Babylon is actually an image of a, a city that's going to come, you can believe it for a second. But with city, it's not a physically identified city as in Rome. If you want to take it, it could be any city in the world. It's not simply cities with sin, like a Las Vegas or an Amsterdam. The idea is a community of people, a socialist order of sorts, a group of people who think that they on their own can make a difference. Look at how the, how the description is given. Let's look at verse chapter 14. And look at the verse 6. And there followed, verse 8, and there followed under the angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine or the wrath of her fornication. The word wrath there is better translated passion. This Babylon is full of passion and she fills the nation with her fornication. Do you see the comparison which happened just a few verses before? You remember the core of the lamp, the one lakh forty four thousand? What was their character? We said they are pure. They are virgins. As against them, what is Babylon that follows the beast? She is a whore. In fact, Revelation 17, if you turn to it later, it says it is the mother of whores. So you see both the mother and the child, and you again look at the imagery, what you saw in chapter 12, the woman was the church, the seed of the woman was also the church, Babylon the whore, Babylon the mother of whores. But this Babylon is fallen. 
But what did she do to fall down? This is what she did. Verse 8. She made all nations, all nations, all people, all tribes, everyone, drank of the wine of the passion. If you're looking around our culture, and you see how easy it is for people to get seduced by the intoxicating influences of everything that happens in the current culture. When people do not see the current culture so full of sin, sadly even the churches don't see that and they want to take some part of the culture into the church. If you want to understand the seduction, you need to just look around. And when you look around, you'll understand how easy it is for our children to get lost here. Because this Babylon looks brilliant. We'll look at her description again later in chapter 17. She is the whole thing. And we have to go back to Babylon again and again because for the nations they're going to come together and do it. They're going to be living together. But for this Babylon God has decided that our time is up. God has decided that he's going to strip her and we read more about that later. And let's look at what the angel says. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Do you see this connection between the two? Do you see this connection between the two? Any person who's worshipping the beast is no different from Babylon. Any person who's worshipping the beast out of fear or enjoined with Babylon to make a great nation of themselves, they are all the same. They worship the beast and his image and they receive his mark. The entire world that we're living in, all of them, will drink, as verse 10 says, the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, verse 10, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. Let me read that verse again for you. Verse 9 onwards. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man... Did you notice the change? Till now, you have the group. Now from the group, from the corporate, we have the individual. Any man. Any man, no matter what group you believe, what group you belong to, what activity you've done, it zeroes in finally to that individual, if any man. And God, that man, God will see to it that he's rip, repaid for everything the woman has done to the saints. By making them drink from the wine of the wrath of God. Do you see the gospel continuing in this? How shallow at times is our preaching to people when hell itself is not shown to them. 
look here, it's not just one angel, but three angels coming down and showing them only one thing, judgment. You will be judged. How? God is going to judge you. He shall make you drink of the wine of wrath. And how is God's wrath shown here? Wine. Why wine? The grapes in this book, the wine in this book, is shown in two different manners. The first manner we read at the second section, or third section, is the grapes are crushed. The red juice that comes from the wine press, the way the wine is made, is the blood of God's enemies. He treads them down. And this wine, when it is fermented, when it becomes a strong drink, God will give it to each person, each of the wicked ones to drink from God's cup of wrath. So he would be confused, stupefied, not even knowing what is happening to him. Turn with me to Psalm 75, verse 8. It says something like this, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and wine is red. It is full of mixture and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Not a drop of God's wrath, not a drop of God's wrath is going to be wasted. Each point of that wrath is going to firm, is going to come on them complete. Do you, did you notice that word? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. It is not diluted. Earlier days, when the wine would have been too strong, they would cut the strength of the wine with a little water. So the wine would not be so strong for a person to consume. But here, look at this. The judgment of God comes unmixed. There is no grace, no love, no mercy. Nothing to even blunt to the edge even one bit. Also, you need to remember this. That this is not at, at this point of time that God's wrath has come to them and to the entire life God gave them mercy. No. The grace, the love, the mercy which has not been mixed with this is part of God's character. They never got it. They will never get it. The grace, the love, the mercy it's God's character. It's God's attributes. Only God's people can get it. This wine is served. Full strength. If you are a part of that Babylon. For now, you might think it's so good to be a part of this culture. It's so good to be alive with all the people around. It's so good to live in a life of wanton sin. The wrath of God is going to come to you unmixed. But that's not all. That's not all. It's not simply the wine of God's wrath. God is going to serve you more things. It's not simply the wine. Verse 11, and oh, sorry, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So it's not only that cup 
they'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. That's the description of hell. Where have you read this before? Obviously, we all know Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the intention of showing this? That they were completely destroyed. But there's something even more. The attack on Sodom and Gomorrah ended with the end of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the attack, the torment, the fire, the brimstone on these people is never going to end. It's an eternal hellfire for eternal creatures who refuse the only self-eternal creator. What is fire and brimstone? Obviously the imagery, we're in the book of Revelation. And the same way we would have struggled to see the throne of God, and John has to use adjectives after adjectives to explain to us how God's throne room looks like. Here, you're looking at God's perfect anger, perfect judgment. Don't expect to see this and understand it clearly. John has to use imagery which people might be used to. That fire, that brimstone that chokes you and you will not be able to breathe, perhaps. That burning that does not stop. That smoke of the torment, as we read in verse 11, that goes forever and ever. And they have no rest, verse 11, for day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I was thinking about hell. Why is the punishment in hell not ceasing? Why can't they just be put in hell once? And if the punishment is done, why can't the punishment be over? Because you need to understand, my dear brethren, in hell, the punishment that they have done, sorry, in hell, the punishment that they're getting is the punishment that is coming from the eternal God against the infinite holiness that he is. And the punishment for their sins is going to be infinite. Not only that, no matter how much they try to pay back, no matter how much they would try to pay back for their own sins, it can never be done. So what happens in hell, you need to understand this, they, their sins do not decline. For a Christian, his mind is renewed. For a Christian, he no longer can think sin. But in hell, that mind is not renewed. That person in hell is constantly in the same mind, same rebellion against God, though in captivity. So what's happening in hell is he sins and he gets punishment. He sins and he gets punishment. People who tell you that in hell punishment will stop one day and they'll be killed or they'll be eternally annihilated, they're completely wrong. They cannot be because their sins are not going to get over. And the judgment of God on them is not going to get over. They have no rest day and night. They have no rest day and night. Have we really given the gospel like this? Have we really told people that if you're rejecting the sun, this is where you're going to go? This is the future that is waiting for you. Not a great utopia. Not a great socialist country. 
not a time when a man will no longer die. This is what you're waiting for. You will have no rest day and night. Now here's something that gets added. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you see a repetition of something here? Turn with to Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I'll read this for you. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count. What does that verse mean at that time? It is wanting you, wanting a believer to come out with the appropriate response. So verse 13 ends with, here is wisdom. Use your mind, use your wisdom to understand what the beast means. And then you come to verse 14. It says, here is the perseverance of saints. What's your response? Persevere in God. Because you have something. Look at that. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's not faith in Jesus. That's obviously implied. But it's the faith of Jesus. The entire content of faith. The body of faith. And what is the body of faith? The commandments of God. Persevere. Have patience. Follow the commandments of God. Keep the faith of Jesus. That's what we are called for. Like Paul tells us, fight the good fight of faith. All the beliefs that you have. Again, let's look at the future. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they might rest from the labors and the works do follow them. I don't want you to get confused here. We are talking about which period? The church period. Which time? The three and a half years period time. We're talking about the entire reign of the Antichrist. We're talking about the time from the time John is writing. So the henceforth does not mean particularly the time that John is writing now. This does not mean of some future period that people will die like the dispensationals have the tribulation saints. No. It's everyone. Read that. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Yea, saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labor, labors and their works do follow them. What was the future of the people with the beast? Who had the mark of the beast? You remember? They have no rest. Day nor night. But what's the future of the believer? They rest from their labors. Oh, how blessed God is. That for me, death, persecution from the devil and be killed by him is rest from our labors. And then in heaven, when I see the opposite side, you remember Lazarus? Remember the rich man? The burning was real. The division was real. But one was resting in Abraham's bosom. The other being burnt continuously.
brothers, are you tired under the devil? Are you worried at times that because you stand for the faith, you might be killed? John tells the first century people as they read this, that tomorrow if you are killed, you'll be resting from your labors. But your labors won't be forgotten. The deeds that you have done, will follow you. The work that you have done will follow you. How blessed is for a Christian. To think that when he dies, God is the one who's going to give him that rest from his labors. I wanted to finish till verse 20, but I think I will stop. But just to remind ourselves where we started. What is the gospel? Is it just the promise of eternal life? Or is it also preaching the surety of God's punishment? The surety of hell? As someone said, if, if the threat of hell is not real to us, Hell would never be sweet to us. If we don't see hell as a real threat to the people around us, to our children, to our loved ones. If we don't see that hell is a real place, but they're going to be tortured night and day. Our gospel will always be weak will always stand for Babylon. We'll always pick things from pagan Babylon to feed that man in sin. Brothers, Babylon has fallen. If you hold on to something that has fallen, not falling, fallen, What would be the point of the entire enterprise? Let's pray that God gives us this. That we, in our gospel preaching, understand that the gospel has to do this very thing. Soften God's people. And harden each one of Babylon. Because we know he who rejects Christ, the wrath of God abides in him forever. Let's look to God in prayer. Father Master, as we come to the text, and we saw the gospel. Oh Master, we pray at this time for all our loved ones. Who may never have seen the truth, probably because they never got the gospel right. Oh Master, forgive us. If we, like the world, have given them what they wanted to listen. Help us, Lord, that as a church, we, each one of us here, as individuals, knows what the gospel is, what the gospel does, what rejection of the gospel does.
hell is real. It's never ending. Your son told us that. Help us, Lord, to fear it. Not because we are going there. We do not want any of the ones that we love on this earth to suffer. Help us, Lord, so like Paul, with everything inside us, let's try to persuade them knowing the wrath of God. Help, Lord, that to keep people from error, to keep our churches from getting mixed into this culture. You give us your eyes, your vision, your truth. Thank you, Lord, for this time. For all the people who could join. In your son's name, we offer this prayer. Amen.